Okay. Great. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the people. Um, so what I want to do uh, the first lecture here is, uh, I guess, eventually just review some of the logistics, make sure we're all synced up, um, but also do a bit of a reprise of the last quarter and talk about some of the things, same things that we talked about uh, at the beginning of last quarter to see if there isn't a, sort of a different perspective that we've gained about them. So, um, and then uh, I'll also try to make some more general comments that get um, folks that haven't been here in a while or that are new, sort of reoriented. Um, right, so, so the, the kind of central motivation of the two-quarter sequence is to, first of all, appreciate how complicated the world can be. And we studied some nonlinear dynamical systems and chaotic systems as examples of that, just examples. Um, and then the question comes up, well, how do I describe the complicatedness of these systems? And part of that answer is to first think carefully about how we measure systems. So I introduced the idea of symbolic dynamics. And then we end up with a, basically a process, a series of measurements, a time series. And we tried to figure out using sort of existing tools in the information theory, uh, what we could do with that. And so we ended up at the end of the quarter, winter quarter, with a set of various characterizations of different kinds of information storage and processing. However, what I want to talk about today is a little bit of a critique of that um, and what it, what it doesn't do. So last quarter, I was a big booster for information theory and how it helps us deal with systems with arbitrarily long-range correlations, apparent organization, apparent information storage, and um, but how it doesn't really get down to the big question. So today what I want to do is a little bit of review, again, hopefully rethinking this now that we have some information theory under our belts, and then to repose the questions that we just came up to at the end of uh, the winter quarter. So if you remember way back 10, 12 weeks ago, um, I tried to frame some of the motivations for the class uh, in terms of the history of the Industrial Revolution, right? So we're thinking here, remember back to the <clears throat> mid-1800s and uh, how there was this huge efflorescence in the sort of technology and engineering and slowly the science and theory of these engines, these heat engines, things that converted heat into mechanical work. And this caused a huge transformation in society. Right? No longer did humans, the product of their effort, be proportional to the amount of physical effort they put into something. Right? Up until that point, everything that you ate or that maybe you used horses to help a little bit <laughs> was pretty much in proportion to our own physical effort. Now suddenly we had these new devices, steam engines in particular, that could amplify that, where we just had to design them and then the source of energy was the heat and convert this uh, abundant source back then, coal energy, into heat and then into useful work. Of course, this was a wonderful thing and it was also a terrible thing. So I, like most scientific and technological innovations, no. Technology giveth and technology taketh away, right? So you can think of the time of Charles Dickens and these huge factory towns, people spinning yarn, you know, these huge rows, all driven by steam engines, of course, uh, but, but kind of uh, a new kind of, of industrial uh, labor uh, oppression came out of that too. In addition to, at least for some classes in society, in England at the time, becoming quite rich because of this amplification and the, the, the interesting picture, though, if you study the history of that, is, is that um, it's not like physics came in and said, oh, let's come up with a theory of converting heat to work and what the limitations are. Oh, good idea. Let's build a heat engine. It was pretty much the opposite, or probably the fair picture, is very much an, an interaction between what you might call engineering, and free commerce, invention, an important part of the acceleration uh, or maybe I should say stabilization of the industrial age was uh, the invent of, invention of the patent system. It was really critical. That stimulated people to actually compete with one another and 
they could get credit for some period of time for the inventions they had and therefore compete and move ahead of others. Um, so it was even kind of a change in, in the legal system uh, that, that was important for this all to work. But it wasn't, you know, theoretical idea, let's build a device. It was very much this, this interaction between um, having invented the devices, the steam engines, people noticed as they tried to improve them that there were certain limitations they kept running into and this led a whole host of now famous physical scientists, Clausius up to Maxwell, Boltzmann and so on to try to figure out what's going on. What, what are the, the physical principles that lead to the conversion of, of, of heat energy, something like disorganized energy into organized energy work at the macroscopic scale that could be harnessed for doing things. So we, so we can see this period of, of you know, a century, more than a century, this interaction between the development of the science of thermodynamics and the theory and the engineering of the Industrial Revolution. So remember, the question I posed was, well, what age are we in? Right? We're sort of in the age of information, or at least that's what, you know, Time Magazine, they should probably put the bit on the cover page or something at some point. But uh, So we keep hearing about all this information age. And of course, this, this, that, that language goes back at least 50 years, right? So this is, in a sense, not terribly new, but it does sort of bring up this puzzle of what's the corresponding um, scientific basis for the information age. Certainly there's a lot of engineering. Right? Universities have very wealthy departments of engineering. Some of them uh, are oriented around computer engineering and computer science so-called. Um, but that's the engineering side of information processing devices. And, and how is it though that we can look at a physical system and understand how it's storing and processing information? Where's the physics uh, of this, the corresponding theory that would be the analog of what thermodynamics and then statistical mechanics right afterwards came to be to give it's basically a scientific, theoretical, and predictive, more importantly, predictive foundation for heat engines. So, um, so that's kind of the largest, you know, if I paint the largest picture, and hopefully you're, well, since we're 10 weeks into this, you're, some of you are halfway convinced that, that there might be some analogous theory here. So, so part of the discussion is just trying to frame it, thinking about what theoretical tools and concepts we have um, to, to think about the information age. Um, right? We have these devices, you know, wonderful little devices here. Uh, they are at sort of one and the same time uh, information processing devices, and that's the way the computer engineers and software engineers look at them. And in particular, if you're trained as a software engineer, you don't even think about the physical basis for this. The fact that this thing gets hot, um, that's certainly a concern to the chip manufacturers, uh, the people who build and design the integrated circuits. And the heat dissipation is the principal reason these devices have stopped getting faster and that we now, to keep people buying new versions of them, we just add more CPUs and bigger, make bigger chips. But the aerial density of information processing hasn't changed so because of heat dissipation. So there's obviously an important connection between how much information processing this thing can do and its physical instantiation. Right? Now as a, as a natural scientist you would look at this and go, oh, it's a physical device. This is a physical phenomenon. How does it store and process information? Are there basic principles of that that would correspond to the three laws of thermodynamics? What would be the three laws of information dynamics for physical processes. And then you can kind of imagine if you want to get a little bit speculative, well, I don't have to think about these designed physical devices. I mean, they're examples of things that process information. But you could also look at other physical, chaotic, nonlinear processes and ask what kinds of information processing are they doing? I mean, you may not be able to run, you know, Excel on a waterfall but it's still a reasonable question to ask. As the waterfall is behaving, it has a certain kind of organization, right? There's some laminar flow at the top, there's spray over here, there's a water crashing at the bottom. At some moment in time, that physical process remembers its history. Well, and forget some of it too. Um, it's also a turbulent fluid, it's chaotic, so it's also itself creating information, excavating very small amounts of thermal fluctuation, um, 
to macroscopic scale to actually place the water drops and the water flow in this unpredictable way. So it's not, it's a fair set of questions. How much history does the waterfall store? How in this, you know, turbulent snapshot of flow, how in the organization is that information stored? And then by what sort of dynamics does it take that stored information to produce future information? So, so that's sort of where we're going. Um, you know, for kind of quick outline or unpacking of what the what means. Um, so there's this contrast I'm kind of drawing, right? So conventional physics and it's maybe slightly unfair characterization. You can think of physics. What you're doing is you're suffering through your physics grad classes, um, <coughs> undergrad physics classes. It's you're being taught that there are different kinds of energy. They get stored in different ways and that these different kinds of energy get transduced into other kinds, right? So the example I use is, right, I'm now increasing the gravitational potential energy and I could turn that into kinetic energy if I dropped it, which I want. So, right, so that's, that's what the different subfields of physics are essentially an attention to different kinds of energy and energy um, transductions. So, so what's the physics of information? Well, we have a similar set of questions. I mean, if you didn't even have a new idea, you'd say, okay, what kinds of information are there? How do they get stored? And how do they, can I change one into the other? And so now, hopefully, when I said that before 10 weeks ago, I was like, what's he talking about? But now that we've talked a bit about information in these nonlinear processes, we have some sense. There are different kinds of information, right? In fact, it's almost becoming an embarrassingly long list, right? There's the entropy rate. That's the rate at which the system creates information. We gave that a mechanistic or deterministic uh, interpretation in terms of if the system we're looking at is a measured chaotic dynamical system, we had this geometric notion of Lyapunov exponents, amplification in the state space of small variations, and that turned into, it was analogous to, the stochastic process that we're looking at, the output of the instrument having a positive entropy rate. So we even have kind of a mechanistic interpretation of what this information production rate was. But we saw, back the very last week, that, that just because a system produces information in the current moment, some of that information is just forgotten. It's called that kind of ephemeral information. But some of that created information gets stored in the system and has an effect on the future. Right? So the the analogy I drew was imagine that you're listening to a piece of music, and there are many. We listen to music partly because it's surprising, so there's a certain amount of randomness and unpredictability that we find engaging. Um, and there are random events that, for example, just sort of happen. You kind of go, oh, that's nice, but then it doesn't have any effect in the rest of the piece you're listening to. Or you can imagine random events like shifting the scale or a, um, doing a chord change. That actually changes the rest of the piece until it happens again. It's a random thing that happens, and it changes the context for all of the future uh, uh, you know, tones and notes coming out of the musical piece. So, so there are different kinds of information. So we can ask how they're, what kinds are there, how they get transduced, and basically same set of questions except we just change the change from an energy view to an information view. Now, of course, these things that we're talking about, the objects we're talking about, like this thing here, um, sort of same device, same phenomena. So we can you know, ask, well, OK, there's a certain amount of energy processing. You know, if I put my hand underneath the bottom here, it's, yeah, it's not too bad. It's a little warm. Uh, but what does that have to do with the information processing of putting this image up here? So there's this question of how these, these, these views are related. How is energy related to information and vice versa? And they're just simultaneous and complementary accountings of the same phenomenon. So in some sense, there has to be some relationship between them. Um, but I think the first fair thing to do is not assume anything at the outset. So you'll remember this, and I want to kind of talk through it again and see if you have a different perspective. So the first claim is, let, let's not conflate the two things. In fact, there are many um, 
uh, arenas in which, which there is a conflation between concepts of energy and information. For example, just to pick one, in uh, machine learning, there are many interesting techniques where there's an analogy that people draw between um, uh, changing parameters in a model and having the model come to equilibrium with the data when it finally describes it well or up to some error. Um, and that is actually a conflation of these two concepts. If you actually look at the mathematics, you'll see information on one hand, probabilities, and of course minus log of probabilities, that's, that's uh, information. And then that's related to an energy. And people now think of learning as moving down, minimizing some energy on a surface. So, so this is actually sort of a non-trivial statement up here. It, uh, depending upon the context, it's either outrageous or obvious. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so let's go back to this. Um, you'll remember it as soon as it starts out here. So, very physical system, right? So we're looking at energy. But of course, how this chain has been set up is to be very delicately poised at a number of these points, such that not that much energy is actually transmitted. Nonetheless, as we go down the chain, there are huge effects happening. That huge relative to how much energy is transmitted from one contingent. I, for me, the first um, thing to say about it is I kind of imagine that there are all of these stages. I don't know, what, like 30 of them. Um, all very delicately designed. I can't imagine the number of takes they had to do to get that to work right. Um, but, but each of these contingent stages transmits only a fraction of the, say, kinetic or gravitational energy, whatever it is. They're, they're, they're different things. And presumably, we could all sort of go through the movie and figure out where the energy is stored, how it's being transduced in the next stage. But if you have 30 stages and you're designing each one of these contingencies to just transmit just the, the smallest amount, say one-tenth, then you get very suspicious of this energy accounting as an explanation for the car rolling off. I mean, come on, that car weighs 3,500 pounds and it rolls off and stops, right? And there's friction there and everything. How much of the initial little tweak that the sort of off-screen person gave, that initial energy is responsible for rolling a 3,000 pound car off a ramp? Well, if each in this simple picture, if every of the 30 stages only had one-tenth the amount of information, we know how much energy is left over. That's 10 to the minus 30. In other words, that's arbitrarily small, right? A tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth, every stage, right? There's something else going on here. 
perfectly plausible, understandable, entertaining. So what is going on? So, 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 so dynamically, what's going on? In a sense, this is like a chaotic system. Every one of these contingent stages is taking some very small effect. Right? There's some phenomenon that uh, they've engineered and poised so that a small incoming perturbation will lead to a large effect. So like one of the curious ones is, I mean, there are many are, but you remember there's a ramp with tires on it? The tire rolls up and just hits the bottom uh, tire on the, on, the, on the ramp and, and it rolls up. Well, how did they do that? Well, what they did is they, of course, put a mass, they positioned it with a mass on the inside of the tire, poised so that it could sort of roll uphill. Yeah? 607 takes. 607 takes. <laughs> okay, yeah. It must have gotten tedious after a while. So, so, uh, so, so, so partly what you have are each one of these stages, there's some kind of stored in energy that then can be released by sort of the smallest little perturbation coming in. Right? And the more delicate each stage is, the more impressed we are, right? I mean, that's part of it. So, so there's something else going on. And we understand that moderately well, because each one of these contingent stages, it's like an amplification. It's like the system is poised at an unstable fixed point, right? And then as it's knocked, it falls off the fixed point and then goes to some other fixed point and releasing this energy to move forward. So it's not... Before, when we were studying chaotic systems, we imagined steady state system or on some attractor, and, we're in the, and the flow in the state space is constantly doing a, that same kind of amplification. But here, what they've done is they kind of laid that out in space. A little instability here grows, causes, and kind of dies away, but then there's enough left over that it can cause the next thing to happen. And each one of these is an instability very much like the ones we were studying with the chaotic attractors. So that was just kind of one process, if you will. So, um, so, so information is being created as we go down there. So, so we have this macroscopic effect. Um, um, we observe this event. There's information. We're surprised. In fact, they were probably really happy after the 607th take to get it right. Talk about a chaotic, unpredictable process. Um, so there's something else going on there that's not well accounted for by the flow and storage of energy. It's part of it. But there's something else going on having to do with these in, this, this, a series of instabilities being built into the chain. So, so that just, again, I, I'm just uh, trying to problematize the issue of, of, uh, of um, how we develop causal explanations for the processes we see around us. And you could, there's part of that causal chain we just saw, there's an energy accounting, and part of it is an informational accounting. So Now, when we started out the, in, in the, the spring quarter, the, the first part was, was really focused on nonlinear dynamics, trying to understand, in a much simpler setting, what we just saw in a chain. I mean, it's deterministic chaos. The, the, the sort of, uh, this is like a, a Zen koan, you know, that, that you had processes or systems that were stably unstable, like constantly amplifying small variations. From afar, they're attracting, we go to some place, rattle around on the solution set, but within the solution set, within the invariant set, it's unstable. So globally stable, locally unstable. So that's how we can now think about stable instability, and it informs a bit of the way we now think about that, that supposedly causal chain um, in the Honda ad. In fact, there's a, there's a name for that, it, it just, just to kind of indicate that it's a kind of spatially distributed instability, it's called a convective instability, and this happens in fluids a lot. A fluid can be stable until it starts to flow, and then it creates a chain of instabilities. So we were just looking at the, that <coughs> similar notion of instability, but in one process. So, and the lesson there is, is that nature, you know, even a few degrees of freedom, even sort of weakly coupled together, actually produces surprise, apparent randomness in information. Right? So this might sound asking, so the instability then is, or the stable instability is each part 
becomes unstable consistently? So I'm a little confused as to what's unstable in this situation. Uh, you mean with the Honda ad or with yeah, the chaotic the attractors? The Honda. Oh, well, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. That, that's a little more complicated thing to try to describe because that is highly engineered. I mean, it's partly why I didn't even talk about convective instability. We just dealt with one chaotic attractor and how we had okay. vector fields and flows that did an amplification. Maybe like each part is a little bit of chaos. And yeah, well, but they, but they, they, <laughs> well, it's somewhat stable, but it's not that stable because they still had to do over 600 takes. Right, so as they're crafting this, they're trying to, I don't know, I don't want to get too metaphorical here, kind of crafting the vector field to keep yeah. it within bounds. But exactly how that exhaust, uh, how the muffler rolls over and just comes up and hits, I'm sure they just had to, um, you know, just, just, just try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but there was definitely, so they, they were engineering the stability. In some sense, there's sort of a, like a tube that was, you know, successfully traversed was the whole series of events. And sometimes it would go off to another track and just stop, right? The muffler goes, huh? Huh? Uh. <laughs> it doesn't make it. It's like, damn it, you have to go all the way back, reset everything. And, uh, so, um, actually the original idea for that was um, uh, a couple of Dutch artists. It's called The Way Things Work. There's a, an earlier piece about 20 years old. Um, so. Okay, so we have this, we have, you know, a, a mechanistic appreciation of how randomness and unpredictability can come to be in studying these chaotic systems. Um, right? in, but before the discovery of deterministic chaos by Poincaré, people just assumed there was this stuff called randomness that just existed. You know, this is what you were playing with when you were gambling. So you even had people like Laplace in the late 1700s writing whole books on the calculus of probabilities, this delicate science of chance. Um, uh, and it was just stuff. There was no notion. I think people had a, an intuition for it, but there's no direct mechanistic notion that nature would actively produce instabilities in a stable way. But there's still a sort of puzzle. What is information? That, that, that view brings up the question of, well, how do we define it? <laughs> um, what's the degree of surprise? Um, Shannon suggests his notion of information. And then uh, where does this stuff come from? And there's also sort of a flip side to this, um, of course, that not everything in the world is random. So, so you might you know, conclude from the study of chaotic systems that even simple but nonlinear, weakly nonlinear systems, simple systems coupled together can be chaotic. You go, okay, fine. The current picture of the world is a bunch of molecules, things banging around. Why isn't the whole world completely chaotic and disordered? So as soon as you start studying and appreciating where randomness comes from, suddenly you realize that can't be the whole story. Otherwise, we'd be like an ideal gas and all, you know, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. We'd all be disassociated. So, so there's the flip side of the coin. Immediately, as soon as you start to understand how randomness can be produced, um, that it's not just something that God decrees exists, but there's like a mechanism to produce it. The flip side is, how is it that the world organizes itself? And I kind of talk through at the beginning of last quarter these different examples of Belosov Zabatinsky uh, reaction diffusion system, right? This is a petri dish with four reagents put in, the kind of red yellow indicator uh, uh, reagent, and every volume element in this thin layer starts to oscillate. And then those oscillations start to synchronize with each other. But Distant regions can be in different phases of their oscillation, therefore there will be boundaries between them where they disagree on what the oscillation should be. And we have these traveling waves and target patterns and so on. Now we talked a little bit about this kind of spatial pattern formation when we studied the cellular automata, which were a much, much simpler discrete state, discrete time, discrete space uh, <clears throat> model of this kind of pattern formation. But it's all over the place. Bacteria, they're Petri dish with agar, 
they put some nasty chemical in there, they all sort of gang up together in these waves, sort of move away from it. This is actually stressed plastic. Remember the last time I, you know, regular plastic, and you just keep stressing and stressing, and suddenly it breaks, and you get this, you know, somewhat random, somewhat ordered, self-similar uh, structure of these channels uh, on Carmen Vortex Street, um, striping on animals. So in this context, the, the ordered, disordered, slightly disordered patterns are important for the ponies recognizing their mom. So, 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 so these patterns can even have a social function, yeah. Uh, can you see the examples of Sierpinski Triangle, for example, mm -hmm. in the nature? Sure, yeah, yeah, there's a whole, yeah, that's one thing I don't emphasize sort of fractal stuff too much, I, I do kind of mention it. Um, <clears throat> the one context we do look at that idea is in the context of, of um, trajectories or orbits or measurement sequences that the very spaces we're in are called cantor spaces, they're all sort of self-similar, so um, yeah, but not so much studying you know, mountain ranges or Romanesco vegetables or whatever. They're, yeah, yeah. But that's a, that's a related idea. And we touched on how you uh, measure the, the the partial dimension of those sets a little bit last quarter. So the flip side of the coin of the of the nature spontaneously producing randomness uh, is that it also orders itself. So how how does this happen? And this, in turn, brings up this question of what do we mean by something being structured or ordered? And this, I would say, these questions um, are much less well appreciated in terms of physical theory. I mean, we, 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 we can visually recognize that these things, these very, very different examples are structured in different ways, but that is calling on a lot of evolutionary history that's built into our visual cortex, us appreciation for some kinds of patterns in the world. So how, um, how do we give a more rational, you know, foundational and quantitative way of measuring organization, structure, regularity, so on, all these different words that need some kind of. And we started to think about that a little bit using information theory. Um, using, for example, when the main idea there was that this kind of mutual information, it was sort of an informational measure of correlation between points of a system. We generalized that to talk about a dynamical system in terms of the uh, mutual information between the past and the future, the excess entropy. It's kind of hinting at the system maybe communicating some information from the past to the future. Um, so that was a start. Uh, in a few weeks, we'll appreciate how impoverished that notion is, but it's a good hint that there's something around the corner. So we have two sides of the coin, and then there's a more kind of dynamical question, <coughs> or evolutionary one if you want. How, how does nature, in its manifestations, balance the two? a tendency to order, a tendency to disorder, a tendency to make structure, a tendency to be unpredictable. Right? Not every system is completely unpredictable, not every system is completely ordered. Most of the things we see around us, that one could argue the very nature of the language systems that we use, are a dynamic balance between a tendency to order and a tendency to disorder. Right? So think about how we're communicating. A language system is basically delicately poised at the interface between these two extremes, randomness and order. Right? There's a certain amount of, uh, we have to share vocabulary. We have to share syntax. So that's the ordered side of the spectrum, speaking metaphorically. Um, however, it's, you know, what I'm saying, I hope, is not completely predictable and ordered. It's not in the vocabulary, otherwise you would have just read it and not showed up today, right? Presumably I'm saying something that's sufficiently novel that you find it interesting and engaging, that hopefully I'm, not only that, I'm, I'm communicating something new that you haven't understood before. However, if I start speaking Swahili, I assume none of us in the room, that would be so random, completely novel and unpredictable, 
but it wouldn't be understandable by you. So you can't be completely random. Right? So, 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 so communication systems, language systems, are a great example in, in this metaphorical discussion here of some kind of cultural process that evolves over you know, well, minutes up to perhaps centuries that produces a communication system that serves a useful purpose. It has a substrate of regulating order in the vocabulary, pronunciation, the phonemes we use, the syntax, but to be useful, we have to communicate something new. So I have to say things that you've never heard before, or new ideas. So it has to be a bit unpredictable, a bit random, but not too much. So, so, so this is just a general question. How does you know, different processes in nature, how they balance production of randomness and unpredictability against generation of order, organization, and structure? And sort of the kind of the largest issue we're going we're to deal with here is um, what I call uh, pattern discovery. So, so before the way I was talking was we're kind of being the Einsteinian scientist. We're looking out at the world, and here's a system I'm trying to describe, um, and thinking about the basic principles that might describe what its organization is. But, but how do we ever come to know new things? Getting back to language example, can I communicate to you things that you've never understood before? I hope so. I mean, that's why we take classes, right? That's why we engage in cultural activities and intellectual activities. And the, con the contrast I draw is what's more familiar, is this, this technology called pattern recognition. Right? So the example I used before was you call up American Airlines if they're still you know, in business and say, I want to go from Sacramento to Chicago. And uh, you're talking to a machine. And the machine has to sort of figure out what the pressure waves on the microphone that got converted into electric pulses means to you. Right? And the way it does it, of course, part of the design strategy is, is all of those, those uh, voice recognition systems, they try to carefully craft the context of interaction. So at some moment in time when you're talking to them, they've told you to say what city you want to go to. And then all the system has to do is distinguish these, these, these pressure wave utterances and classify them into cities. In addition, behind all of that, even once you've constrained that context to help improve the recognizability of what you said, there, there are speech engineers who carefully craft, and now I can say it and you'll know what I mean, hidden Markov models just like we studied that describe, they, they choose some number of states for a phoneme, like shh, like in Chicago. The system takes a Fourier analysis, breaks it into time windows, and looks at the most energetic Fourier components. And then there's a hidden Markov model down inside that's being calculated. And it tries to figure out what the probability is for the shh phoneme or the go phoneme, these different hidden Markov models, and which most likely explains or predicts that <coughs> input. That, that utterance, the pressure or voltage waveform. That's all done by hand. <laughs> That's all crafted by hand. Very tedious. Especially for these systems like airlines and you know, big, big services we use where you, you, they're called speaker independent. Um, and really actually the key idea is the first thing I said. Crafting the context of interaction so the system doesn't have to, you know, detect that you were saying the Gettysburg address, you're just going to say a city name. So, so that's pattern recognition. Namely, the system has built into it a vocabulary, a pre-engineered vocabulary, a series of templates, and then what it does when the data comes in, it matches against that, probabilistically, calculates the likelihood that the data coming in was Chicago, and then if that's sufficiently high compared to all, all the other alternatives in this, in this vocabulary, in this template, uh, then it assumes you want to go to Chicago. That begs the question. So the question for us is, how do we discover new patterns, <coughs> concepts, ideas, new patterns that we've never seen before? We do do this. I hope it's happening now. 
and back to the language example, right? Kind of putting things together. And I, that to me is, is, is the biggest mystery. It, even on a very practical plane, it's extremely important. When I first, so if I throw out, pick some, some nonlinear dynamical system, the OWL system, some variation, the, the Van der Poel oscillator, the whatever. Imagine you hadn't seen the Lorenz differential equation before. You don't know how the system is going to behave. And there's certainly a series of initially very straightforward tools, calculate the fixed points, all the kind of boring stuff you do. Initially, because you can turn the crank, it's very straightforward to do those analyses. But then you want to understand, oh, what's the shape of the attractor? The thing you hadn't really understood before. And somehow we come to do that. We actually do actively build our own vocabulary and discover new things. So, so in addition to maybe thinking about you know, how we discover new ideas through communicating with each other, there's, there's even a simpler context when we're looking at nonlinear, chaotic, and complex systems, how we come to learn about them. What's new? We learn about them or we make the computers to understand us when we say something new, for, for instance, yeah. a new city. Right. Chicago, maybe computer know about Chicago. Right. But Right. Maybe right. City. You, you want to uh, right. make the computer understand us or we recognize? Well, I mean, eventually both, yes. right? So, so uh, I'm unaware of any speech recognition system that learns new vocabulary. They have enough difficulty just getting cities correct <laughs> in a fixed yeah. set, but. What I'm hinting at here, if we can understand, first of all, what patterns are inform through information processing and so on, ideas, then can we understand that well enough that we, in fact, could design? I mean, the real test wouldn't be, oh, I like that theory of pattern discovery. It would be, I actually understand enough what the mathematical definition, the formal aspects of pattern are, and I can calculate various quantities, that I could write a program so that machines could innovate new ideas. And that, to me, is sort of the, you know, if I had to think about uh, how I would pitch this against the way people have approached artificial intelligence, this question of pattern discovery is sort of my version of that. I don't, I'm not personally so interested in how, um, how well a computer can play chess. I can kind of imagine how you'd engineer such a thing, and eventually, with enough hardware and a team of 100 <laughs> software engineers and giant databases and new technologies and they, you know, you know, machines can be, that's, I'd like to see a system that could actually discover new things. So that to me is, is the real kind of um, decision criteria for success and understanding patterns, and this process of learning, adaptation, and discovery, right? It sounds, I don't know if you take it the right direction, it sounds kind of like an expansion of the problem of yeah, 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 it's like induction. Well, I, we'll have, I mean, I'll go through some examples. I'm, I'm kind of throwing these things out. It probably sounds very philosophical and hopefully interesting. Um, but uh, there are some examples uh, that we can go through that show you uh, cases where you can go from sort of wrong assumptions to limited a vocabulary and actually expand it. So there's a notion, it's, it's like hierarchical induction. And the example case is extremely familiar to us all. This happens at the onset of chaos in the logistic map. I'll just throw that out there. We'll, we'll get there. But, but there, there's... Well, we know, actually, that the excess entropy diverges, right? We went through that. They had a logarithmic dependence on word length. Remember, that was diverging. So it's kind of hinting that this past future, mutual, past future mutual information was going to infinity. Look at longer and longer uh, words. There's more and more correlation in, in, in these long sequences. So what kind of information is that? It turns out it's highly structured. And if you approach that infinite correlation system with any kind of finite model, it's always going to be an approximation. So we're going to talk about how to use, it's kind of like a higher level modeling. You build models, you build better models, you build better models, and they grow. And you look at how they grow. And in the case of the logistic map, we're going to end up with a non-finite model of the information stored. The nice descriptive thing where I can calculate everything, including various rates of divergence of the 
information stored. Yeah. So I mean, it's like you, I mean, in this theoretical framework, if you do come up with an algorithm to discover new patterns, how, how do we how do we adequately test for things like overfitting? With yeah. Other, other right. Machine learning right. Really excellent point. So so yeah. In in, in fact, it lets me. Um, Right. So the question is overfitting, right? So what is overfitting? Well, if I have 100 data points and I fit it with a straight line, I can have terrible error if it's a random scatter of points. But if I use a 100th order polynomial, I'll have no error. But that model doesn't generalize well. So there are different ways of monitoring and characterizing overfitting. What we're going to do here is not really talk so much about the effects of finite data Initially, what, what the goal here is to talk about what are the foundational concepts that let us define clearly what pattern is, what, it, what organization is, what models are. And then once we understand the kind of substrate of the different kinds of model classes, then we can come back and say, oh, well, if I only give you a thousand measurements, how good is this model going to fit? And, then, and then, then, then we can come back to overfitting and underfitting and that kind of thing, generalization error. Once we know what the, the substrate is, a lot of the work in, in machine learning, when it's trying to characterize overfitting, there are often these very implicit assumptions about a model class that gets fixed ahead of time. So, you know, finite state hidden Markov models with 10 states or fewer. And then you can study, oh, well, if I have two, two data samples, I'm obviously not going to infer the transition probably very well. But there's some kind of trade-off. So, so what we're going to do is, is try to give a kind of a model class independent view of what structure is, and then we'll come back to thinking about, in practical cases, how we can infer things. So we'll likely have a couple lectures on Bayesian inference for the class of models we develop. But first it's going to be kind of, in principle, infinite data, not going to worry about statistical or sample fluctuations. Just what are the basic principles first? And, that, and that's a bit different than, than what you, you go pick up a book on statistical learning theory. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. So now a little more uh, drilling down a little bit about kind of the outline of how we're going to, well, where we've come from and where we're going, right? So, so, well, so far, nonlinear dynamical systems, systems that produce one. Structure, they're attracting, stable, and chaos, unstable. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, self organization and spatial systems, but even the uh, chaotic attractors are examples of what um, a spontaneous organization, it's just the very flow in the state space down to the attractor, is an ordering for us. And then once you get on the attractor, there might be this positively optimal exponents and instability and therefore unpredictability, but the initial flow corresponds to the emergence order. I can start from any random initial condition. I'm going to end up in this part of the state space. Just that simple transformation, visiting a small part of the state space, is an ordering. And then, well, the chaos is just, well, some of these nonlinear systems can be um, kind of built-in instabilities. So, so, so we need to talk about those two things. And, and, and we have you know, a bit of a survey of, of what, what Emergence of order, emergence of chaos can be. What we're going to do uh, uh, this quarter is talk more directly about computation, storage, and processing of information, and the basic ideas we need. So we kind of tie that back up. So, so the first winter quarter was really just dynamical systems, this mechanistic view of how you can produce order and randomness. Use information theory uh, as the first step at quantifying this and trying to get a handle on these uh, properties of, of um, information storage and processing. And the spring is going to be what I call computation mechanics. It's taking statistical mechanics and thinking about going beyond statistics and asking how mechanical systems store and process information. Uh, directly. And we're going to learn some new things. There, there are, I'm going to completely recast information theory. 
practically, we're going to end up with very efficient algorithms for calculating all the things we've been calculating and that you are calculating in your homeworks tediously. See, you missed this. <laughs> you had it last year. Uh, right? I mean, before I've said, oh, calculate the word distribution and then plug that into the block entropy and take the derivatives and all that. And well, as you know, in the homeworks or the final exams, kind of tedious. Well, it would be nice to have a framework, a model class, where you can calculate those things directly. So, so it's not only going to be sort of rethinking what it means for any system to store and process information, think more directly as mechanisms that compute, but also we're going to end up with very practical ways of efficient ways of calculating these information quantities. So, so how are we going to approach this? Well, we're still on this diagram, right? Right. This is head yeah. inside the box. That was the dynamical system. So we spent a certain amount of time with the symbolic dynamics, how you design instruments. Then we had these, well, almost <laughs> the way I presented binary processes, processes over binary alphabets, and then we tried to characterize them with various kinds of information measures. So what's that leap? Just this next step. But at least up to this point, it's a very, you know, I'd like to argue it was a moderately complete analysis, right? We had this tableau we came up with. I, mean, I, I sort of simplified things by sort of focusing on just the block entropy, and how that grew as a function of the word length L. Again, somehow you have to start with a word distribution, but then it's just simply, you know, applying Shannon's formula to the word distribution of words of length L. We get this number out. And recall the benefit of this is again, also very practical. Instead of a bag of an exponentially increasing number of words in their probabilities, we just have the scalar number. So it's, and it just kind of measure how flat the word distribution was. Okay, so this grows, right? longer sequences have more information, it grows, and then we have this linear asymptote with the excess entropy being the offset, and the growth rate being the information production per unit time, the entropy rate. Uh, we had the, the transient information here, which is the area that kind of control how quickly the H of L curve meets this linear asymptote. And then remember we discussed how this is actually a measure of synchronization, how much information you need to pull out of a process to understand what state the process is in. So it was like a roadmap. You know, basically it was what, two, three weeks of lectures, boom. So this tableau, very helpful kind of roadmap. Which is the way, as you've noticed, I like to do things. Classifying, roadmaps, tableaus. And you know, then there were the consequences we could we could draw out, right? Once we have this overall picture, there are different kinds of questions. So if you remember, uh, so here's our our block entropy curve here, and uh, now imagine that we try to explain what's going on, but we don't know about this excess entropy thing. In a sense, we assume the process has no memory, so that means we're trying to estimate the slope. Here, which is the information production rate, the entropy rate, by a line that goes to the origin. And you can see, so, that, so this is now a memoryless source, an IID source, and it comes up and hits here with a slope that's larger than the linear asymptote, which allows the, the y intercept to flow. So the way we say that is if you ignore the fact the process is structured, you ignore the fact that it has memory, set e equal to zero that turns into an estimate of the degree of randomness and unpredictability that's larger than the truth. Right, so, so an agent that has uh, inferior modeling capacity looks out at the world, can't appreciate all the structure that's out there, but to the extent it misses that structure, E in this case, that gets converted into apparent randomness. In a way, it's kind of moving in the direction of, OK, now I have the principles laid out. What kinds of practical questions can I answer? Okay. Just like finite data sample is another, would be another kind of uh, way of thinking about this. How, how does finite data affect that underlying theory? And if you remember, all of that picture, the tableau, came from a very simple uh, uh, procedure of uh, taking uh, derivatives with respect to the word length. So we went from block entropy to the entropy rate, uh, predictability gain, then we integrated these derivatives, we have the total predictability or redundancy, the excess entropy, and the transient information. So they're all systematically 
derived. Once I have my word distribution, I get my block entropy, and then I discover these various quantities just by taking derivatives. So, thinking back to the Industrial Revolution, there were different kinds of energy. Uh, we're trying to play the same game. There are different kinds of information, right? So we ended uh, last quarter with all these different things. Measures of randomness or surprise, entropy of a random variable, or the entropy rate for, for processes that are not IID, that could have arbitrarily long-range correlations. We had to look at infinitely long words. Compressibility, well, that was related to the redundancy, log of the alphabet size, minus the intrinsic randomness per symbol. That's how much can be extracted out, uh, compressed out. The transmission rate, right, we have information, transmission channel, shared information between the input and output. Um, we applied that to thinking of a, of a process or dynamical system. The shared information between the past and the future, that was the excess entropy. Synchronization was the transient information. We had the ephemeral information, right, that part of the spontaneously generated information that just gets forgotten. The system just throws it away. And then the complement to that was that part of the spontaneously generated information that gets stored and has an effect on future behavior. That was the bound information. So there you go. So like I said, that, that list is kind of getting a bit long here. But at some point, you start to see there's kind of a calculus for discovering these things. So that's you know, are starting to understand the different kinds of information, how they get transduced between each other. Uh, and that turns into a very practical analysis pipeline. Which, to a certain extent, the homeworks have been building up to, right? So if you're willing to take this at face value, well, the first thing you do is you have to figure out where your information source is. Maybe it's some uh, dynamical system, well, it could be Cellular automaton, spatial system could be some dynamical network, could be a high dimensional system, low dimensional system, deterministic dynamic or stochastic, whatever. First, find your system, and then you design your instrument. You sort of do your symbolic dynamics analysis so that you can get your informative symbols coming out of it. Then somehow, either you know, if you're doing this analytically, you calculate the word distribution, or if it was from some experiment, then you estimate these word distributions. Okay. And then you go through this information theoretic analysis to start to figure out what kinds of information there are, how random it is, how predictable it is, how much stored, how hard is it to synchronize to, and so on. Okay, so there's a pretty straightforward algorithm here that comes out of that. So we had, you know, this sort of enriched sense of how dynamical systems can be complicated, right? You know, chaotic attractors, it's sort of a notion of state complexity and state space. We didn't really discuss it too much, although I did introduce it when we started, um, you know, by way of, of talking about general theory of dynamical systems. There's also complication of other scales in a dynamical system, basins of attraction, right? Over here in the state space, it could be a fixed point. Over here, limit cycle. Over here, chaotic attractor. So you can also talk about the complicatedness on the basis of attraction, and then also how complicated the behaviors change as you vary some control parameter. So a lot of the discussion was just focusing on these attracting invariant sets, and the chaotic ones were the most interesting, but there are also other levels of complication that you could ask about their role in storing and processing information. So, so yeah, so, so we end up here with, through the symbolic dynamics, this rather direct mapping from dynamical systems, this sort of mechanistic view of what's going on in state space. <clears throat> Thinking of the, the resulting behaviors as reflecting some kind of information processing. So that's all well and good. So now for the critique. Right, we have you know, these ideas, a new sense of the Wonderful diversity of different kinds of information. It's kind of intrinsic semantics of that. They all kind of make some sense. Isn't that the end of the story? No, not really. Practically, it's just a pain to calculate all these things, essentially estimate them from the word distribution. Um, um, 
and you know, even maybe more basically, <laughs> information theory never really says what information content is. And Claude Shannon, right, the inventor of communication theory, he was very explicit about this. This is the power of the theory. I'm going to tell you how much information there is, or how being in an information source. I'll tell you what the mutual information is between the input and output of a channel, and I'll give you a theorem. As long as this amount of information in the information source is less than the transmission capacity of the channel, there exists a way of encoding that information such that you can get it through a noisy channel error-free. Never ever once says anything about information content. Is that the Gettysburg address? Is it the Encyclopedia Britannica? Is it some MP3 file? Doesn't matter. In fact, that's kind of the wonder of the internet. It doesn't matter. Right? It's, the net is supposed to be transparent end to end. But that's kind of a burning question. I mean, it does make a difference whether it's some, to, to me, whether I'm reading you know, the New Yorker or reading Gettysburg address or article by Stanislaw Lem, the science fiction writer. It means I want, I want more than just Shannon's operational interpretation of information. It's just his quantitative approach. And the other thing is it doesn't really, information theory doesn't really give us a direct measure of structure. Um, now you might say, well, now just a second. I can think of a process as an input-output, you know, information transmitted from the past to the future, like a communication channel. Uh, isn't the excess entropy that mutual information a measure of structure and organization? And I kept using the word memory, but you might remember also that I kept saying apparent memory, apparent stored information. There's actually a subtlety here. We can't appreciate that, that this, this sort of raw information theory view of a process, sequences of measurements, how much shared information is there between the past and the future, that's inadequate. So we'll, we have to unpack this a little bit. The, the counterexample to using to, to the excess entry being interpreted as the amount of information the process stores um, is that there are processes that are very, very structured, have lots and lots of stored information, and have excess entropy arbitrarily close to zero. We call those the cryptic processes, so we'll come to talk about that. But this is sort of a more um, direct motivation for looking for something more than information theory. And it really is to, to, to get to, okay, we have all these informations, now what? I mean, it really is to get to this. So this is all of spring quarter. What does it mean to build a model of a process? And again, we're going to do it kind of in principle, worry about sample size and things like that. I mean, and what are these states, things anyway? I mean, we've been using models. We had to because it's so tedious just to talk about raw processes and sets of sequences and their probability. That's just tedious beyond belief. So we talk about Markov chains and hidden Markov chains and all that just so we had transition matrices, things we could calculate with and talk about states. But that begs the question. Right? I assume those models. The question in front of us now is if I give you a process, a word distribution, can you figure out, actually, does the data tell you what the right model is? Not you saying, oh, it's Chicago, the first phoneme. Oh, that's got to have 13 states and 12 transitions, positive probability. No, not imposing it on the data but ex discovering it from the data. So how do you do that? How, I mean, what, what, what do we mean by state? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of intuitive on the one hand. We use it a lot, sort of like saying system or something like that, or network. Everything is a system. Everything is a network. Uh, after a while, everything's got states. We really have to think more carefully about what states are. So that's, that's actually the first kind of week or two, just thinking about what states could be. And can we extract the effective states given the kind of raw data of the process. So the way I look back at the, the, the winter quarter is that it posed a number of questions. And I kept trying to keep myself from when I was describing things of not, you know, giving you the punchline. <laughs> but we came up to thinking about like, well, what is a model? I was just saying, what are, what are the hidden states? If I have the hidden states, I somehow I've reconstructed the state space. Oh, 
Okay, you're in Bolden. Now you think, oh, now give me the equations of motion. Give me the vector field over the state space. So can you get not only the state space, but also the equations of motion? That's pretty outrageous, right? If I give you some data, what I'm saying is, oh, here's a, here's a, here's a program. I'm teaching a machine how to build a theory. It's like, wait a second, I'm the theorist here. I write down the differential equations. What do you mean I just give raw data to a program and it spits back to me the theory, the set of differential equations, all the right-hand side, all the forces, it, it gives that to me. Well, it turns out you can do that. <laughs> now, there might be this sort of an objection. It's, it's like, well, it depends, just like the speech engineers for uh, American Airlines. They're making all sorts of choices. So, so to what extent, when we do these inferences or estimations or discoveries or whatever, can we get around the subjectivity of it? You know, do I always have to assume it's a sort of Markov chain of 12 states? Or can I figure out the number of states? Um, is it always going to be dependent on the amount of data I have? Is there a way of ever getting beyond finite data to start figuring out what the truth is? Uh oh, there's that word. Well, how can, I mean, we like to think as scientists we do objective work. But a lot of what we do is steeped in subjectivity. Like, what experiment am I going to do? What do I like to do anyway? And, you know, do I want to sit in a dark room with the heavy magnets for late at night? So it's a lot of you know, subject, subjectivity all the way down. Of course, what I mean here is just I'm trying to got some data or description of a process. How much of what I understand about the, 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 the randomness generating properties and the structure of the process is due to me making some assumption? And how much is actually the case? So we're going to work in a framework where we can answer those questions, where we can see uh, that there's a difference between a subjective view and a kind of an objective view. I already kind of talked about that a little bit when I was talking about how structure in the world, if you ignored that it had structure, that turned into apparent randomness for you. So we're actually going to come up with systematic ways of talking about degree of subjectivity. And to do that, we need some, some, some sort of foundation for representations for processes. So that will be, that'll be as a, princ a principled way to model processes in kind of a mathematical setting. There will always be kind of uh, finite data variations in this. So, so and then, then once we start talking about this sort of principled way of modeling process, having the data tell us how the process should be represented, it brings up all sorts of interesting questions about cause and effect. Right? There's sort of a debate raging right now in kind of philosophy of science about whether you can you can measure uh, cause and effect in an objective way, or whether you always need a human doing experimentation, um, kind of intervening in the system and moving components in and out. Well, that's an interesting idea, except <laughs> the system, the very phenomena we're trying to study are systems that are coupled together. If I remove a coupling, I destroy its behavior. It might become non-chaotic. And what, can, what, what kind of statement can I make about causal effects in a chaotic system if, I'm, if, if, if the paradigm is I have to remove components and see if they're important or not? When component removal, just like the study of life, <laughs> many studies of life kill the life to understand something. It's the same problem. So very interesting set of questions. In fact, it would be a great set of projects, even kind of almost philosophical projects about thinking about cause and effect in this current debate. And then sort of more practically. What things can we actually analyze? It's one thing. I'll, I'll paint a very general picture of sort of the mathematical theory of doing these things. And it's like, OK, does it work for my system? And there are all sorts of different you know, trade-offs and things like that. Finite data. We have the right sort of representational system set up for this. What's analytical? What's numerical? What can we simulate? What can we estimate from, from uh, experimental data? So here's the punchline. Basically, we've been studying information and understanding how that gets generated by non-identical systems. Now we're going to talk about a related but complementary notion, computation. And that is how we're going to talk about structure, oddly enough. You know, the, the way to kind of draw the contrast, and this, this hopefully will take on more meaning as the weeks go forward. So how nature is structured, the organization that we see around us, is actually a reflection of how nature is computing, storing and processing information. So I'm going to try to stitch together these two ideas. 
you know, the organization, regularity, symmetries that we see around the world, those are actually reflections of how nature is storing and processing the information. That'll be the claim. You can disagree with me, but that'll be the claim. So, it's all good. Time to get that. So, the goals, well, we've hit two of them already. Presumably, y'all can go out and sort of identify sort of mechanisms of instability, potential chaos. Right? The Honda app, you now have a different notion of the role of instability there, and we have ways of quantifying that. So, now what we're going to do is Analogous goals, but really focus in on how to identify and quantify structure. What, what, what is happening? In the world. And then relate both unpredictability and structure to this extended notion of what I call intrinsic computation. Uh, let me skip a few things here. There are lots of applications. Um, you know, one, 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 if, if you understand how arbitrary processes can store information and do computation, then maybe you can come up with whole new substrates for building computers, harnessing that. You know, go back to analog computers. Think about in the quantum setting, what, what kind of na nano scale devices can we now build when we have this we're sort of unshackled from this digital hegemony of current computation, and there's this generalized notion that we have. We can then sort of look around for that. And also, it gives you know, maybe more scientific uh, implications, thinking about how evolutionary systems produce biological organisms, how you know, form is similar or different from the function of the organism. And if you're a big fan of automated data, you look at these ideas and you go, boy, we should be able to apply this to you know, petabytes of data coming out of spontaneous formation of social networks on Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of thing. Try, try to actually have a system that will actually aid well, hopefully natural scientists producing theories and for more and more complex systems. So I'm going to skip ahead pretty quickly here. Well, I won't go over this, um, but just since some people are new. So we have uh, Karana who's sitting in the back. She and Alex sitting in the back uh, who will be TAs. And then Ryan will also kind of TA, but he's running the... Um, the, the server that has all the homeworks and stuff on it. So, um, and maybe next week I'll try to uh, ask some more questions about who we all are. Um, again, of course, website hasn't changed because this is where everything goes through. Everything, everything, everything. I put announcements up probably twice a week there on average. When the homeworks are up. Um, how to get information, how to enroll, all that sort of thing. Here are emails. And of course, all the lecture notes are online at the website. Just go to lectures. Um, there is an outline. There's a PDF of these lectures. Uh, when this gets finished, there'll be the slides with voiceover. It's recording that now. There's also an HD recording. And um, I put the slides with voiceover up on YouTube. And then there's another link for the HD so you can see the lecture again. Even for last quarter? Yeah, it's all there. Yeah, except, as we recall, a few screw-ups. <laughs> yeah, and then there's another group of students down at Berkeley also taking the class, so that's for them and us. Yeah, so it's all um, going into the ether here. Office hours, Wednesdays, 3 to 4, and um, Ryan and Corona want to update theirs, so look at the, the home page. For the class. Okay, uh, the the website has readings, number of readings. Um, I think I mentioned in one slide what what to read for Thursday. Uh, the homeworks are up there. Um, so the homeworks are all um, announced and done online through a web browser. So there's a system called Sage. It's documented at sagemath.org. Um, but you can go to uh, the top of the course homepage. It says CMPY Campy Server. You go there and there are instructions on how to log in. And then you can just send Ryan an email and he'll set you up with an account. I think everyone else, you need an account. Yeah, yeah so, so do that. Um, and, then, and then, like I said, every Tuesday I will put up the homeworks for the week. They're due a week later. And, uh, and what you'll see is there's a little tutorial you should go through with Campy, and you might need to um, 
get some help from Ryan or Karan or Alec to get started this moderate amount of ramping up, which everyone else has done and kind of suffered through. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but the point is, don't don't hesitate to ask. There, there's there's stuff to learn, and maybe even sitting down with Ryan or Alec or Karan for a half an hour just to get started and really accelerate things rather than kind of get frustrated with things that are obvious. So. Um, well, that was winter, so that's all done. So spring is different than having the exams and the homeworks. Um, basically, it's just homeworks. We'll do maybe half a dozen homeworks. You're going to start using the computational mechanics in Python routines and packages in much more detail. So there'll be um, um, helper labs that you go through first before you do the homeworks. Some of them also just kind of parallel the lectures, so you can see how some things work out. And then there'll be a project. So first half a quarter, Homeworks, and then I'll be kind of pushing you, probably starting week three, to think of a project, right? Some kind of uh, choose some dynamical system, space-time, low-dimensional chaotic system. Maybe if you're a statistical physicist, you want to do spin system, some network system. Your choice could be spike trains. Whatever, choose some system, and then project will be to maybe write some simulation code or something like that, analyze these computational and information, informational properties. And then the question is, of course, what do they tell you? That's the key thing. They, you can just do this stuff. Presumably, they're supposed to, they will tell you something new about the system. Yeah. Right. Does it have to be a real system? Real. Like an actual... You ask me? Real? I don't do real. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Whatever. I mean, it, yeah, it could be real. Could be real. <laughs> well, well, actually, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, Christina actually real kind of did a real. She put together last uh, was it year before winter um, uh, an analog computer that simulated the driven van der Poel oscillator. So that was sort of a, a simulator in a sense, but it was real physical circuits. She did it over in the lab. It was an. I mean, I, I enjoyed the project, um, and uh, uh, yeah, we actually put together this circuit that solves the van der Poel differential equations and you have a sine wave generator and you can hear it go chaotic and make all sorts of strange noises and... Do you have to argue that it relates to anything useful? No, oh, no, 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 not at all. No, I mean, you know, it, yeah. My typical role in choosing the projects is that they're tractable. I mean, the, you know, be careful. These are nonlinear, complicated systems. They can be dissertation topics which I think your spring project is such a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a biological project on uh, tendrils that vines send out to grab onto each other, which maybe you can mention that at some point. But yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so actually, where is it? Right here? Well, anyway, uh, at the bottom of the homepage, there is a description of the projects, uh, you know, roughly, what these, it gets some sense, but also the list of all the last, all the previous year's projects, so you can get some idea. There are 30 or 40 more than that projects down there. Get some sense of what people have done. The reports are there, the presentations. <coughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, the project will be uh, concretely a uh, little presentation to the class, say 15, 20 minutes at the end of the quarter. Um, since we have folks at Berkeley, what I've done is found a place that's halfway between Davis and Berkeley, so we're going to have like an all-day conference barbecue conference where we'll do this. It's down in Martinez, which is actually accessible by train. Not, I'll give you more information on that. Um, and, uh, and some kind of you know, written report, code if, if that was involved. Um, yeah, and definitely take a look at what else was there. Um, uh, but like I said, often I'm trying to simplify things and make them tractable in just a few weeks. So that's my role is to simplify. Uh, books haven't changed, really. We're not actually done with Strogatz or Cover and Thomas, uh, um, even the homework that I put up um, last night for this week. Uh, still doing some things in Cover and Thomas to set us up for next week. Uh, but you might think, when you're thinking about projects, certainly going back and looking at some of the exercises at the end of the chapters, might stimulate things. There's interesting models in there. Um, biological, chemical, electrical, and circuit models would be perfect to analyze. Um, and of course, yeah, lecture notes are online. Also, all of the articles that we get, supplementary articles, published articles that we'll read, and other things are there at the website. Um, yeah, so like I said, um, since you folks are new, I really think you should get some direct help 
with um, the Sage and Campy servers. Um, hopefully, you've had some experience programming. Programming? Yeah. A little bit. Python? Yeah. Python? It's a language Python. No. Okay. Definitely talk to Alec or Karana or Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Um, yeah, so this is the URL for that server. It's actually linked on the top of the page. So there's just a thing here. It takes you there. And um, there's even a link on the page you go to of how to get you know, Ryan's email and how to set up a, a, a account there. Um, so reading to do. Um, I can move it over here. Um, so between order and chaos is this recent nature physics review I wrote. Um, that will give you an overview of what's coming up. Skim it. Not, you don't have to do it in depth because that's going to take us five weeks to cover it. So, but just to get some sense of where we're going. Also, computational mechanics, uh, pattern of prediction, structure and simplicity. Just the introductory sections of that might help orient you a bit. Um, and for fun, uh, take a look at this Stanislaw Lenin, Polish science fiction writer who just passed away half a dozen years ago, uh, but he actually knows information theory and statistics. So he has this nice New Yorker article called Chance and Order. that will bring up some of the questions, or reframe some of the things I said already. And there's a quick, very, very uh, newsy, uh, readable New Scientist article by Mark Buchanan. It kind of talks about this idea of reconstructing order from chaos.